Hello viewers and welcome back to another episode. In today's episode we're going to be taking a nostalgic look back to 1980. We'll be having a look at this. Sony's first ever portable Betamax video recorder. Stay tuned. So the year is 1980, and what a year it was for inventions and movies. The long-awaited sequel to Star Wars was finally out at the cinemas, The Empire Strikes Back, along with an impressive new toy line from Kenner. The first affordable home computer is finally available priced at just £79.95, unbuilt, £99.95 built, from a British company called Science of Cambridge Limited, model number Sinclair ZX80, with 1K of RAM. A computer in your pocket is introduced by Sharp of Japan, the PC-1211, and it's the dawn of the consumer portable video era. If you wanted to record a special event such as a birthday party or a wedding back in the day, before video, you would use something called a cine camera. A cine camera would take a reel of unexposed film, much like a 35mm film camera. And of course the early cine cameras were picture only, there was no sound. It's hard to imagine that today, isn't it? Just imagine trying to record a video today on your smartphone without any sound. But as the years went by, cine cameras came along with sound. So you were able to record sound and a picture. But as some of us will remember, sending off the 35mm films for development and waiting in anticipation for them to return, often you would find pictures would be blurry or even under or overexposed. And then of course you needed a projector and a screen to project onto to view back your precious memories. These days we have video cameras that not only have built in screens to instantly replay your recordings, but some models even have a built in video projector, like this model here. And this is already 5 years old. Amazing. But now it's 1980, we finally have a consumer portable video recorder and camera from none other than Sony. Now Sony have been making portable video equipment already, but this was for the professional market, for television program makers, and also for scientific and hospital use. The format used for that gear was called Umatic. There were two size tapes, a larger tape for the four size machines, and a smaller tape for the portable gear, but Sony decided to use a different format altogether for the domestic market, Betamax. Betamax was very similar to Umatic, but the tapes were smaller again. Priced at around £625 in 1980 for the VCR alone, it certainly wasn't very affordable. In today's money that equates to around £2,500 in 2023. Only the very wealthy could afford one. Here in England, you could rent such equipment daily through a company such as Radio Rentals of Granada. And in fact, this was my first experience with this very camera. I remember coming back from school one day and my parents saying, you can see yourself on TV now. Something you take for granted now, but back then it was absolutely amazing. This is a commercial urging you not to buy something. Strange. The very latest TVs have FST, but don't buy one. FST doesn't mean fairly smart teak. <laughs> it means flatter square tube, which means a brighter, clearer picture. But don't buy one. Rent. Rent from Radio Rentals and you can chop and change to keep up with ideas like FST. That's why Radio Rentals say you'll be glued to our sets, not stuck, 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 stuck. Weighing in at just under 10 kilos for the VCR alone, it wasn't very light compared to today's standards. Combining the latest technology in electronics and mechanical engineering, it was an absolute marvel for the time. And with this model, you can actually play back your recorded footage instantly from the camera's built-in black and white electronic CRT viewfinder and listen to the sound with an earpiece. This is something you could not do with cinefilms as you had to send it off to be processed and pray your footage was not overexposed or blurry. So you can imagine the cine camera offerings soon started to dwindle with the event of the portable video home system, especially with the expense of developing the film. The camera I'm using here is actually the HVC3000P, the one that was launched with the SL3000 
was the HVC 2000P. The 3000P was slightly better in that it worked much better in lower light conditions indoors for example and the price of this camera was £649 bringing the combined total to about £1300 back then so in today's money you're looking around about five grand. And of course you still had to buy your own tapes and they weren't cheap either. You were looking around about £30 for a half an hour footage. Also available to go alongside this machine was a matching tuner timer unit. This would allow you to record terrestrial television programs. Let's take a look at the features and benefits of these machines. I actually find this tuner time unit quite aesthetically pleasing to look at. It's certainly very reminiscent of the 1970s. Lifting up the top panel reveals the thumb wheel tuning mechanism for the analog tuner. The front of the unit is quite sparse for connections. There's a remote control input along with a camera port. On standby and timer switch. Input select switch for tuner or line input. Charging lamp indicator. And a fluorescent tube clock. Concealed behind the flap, you have a dimmer switch for the display itself, along with the time shift settings and clock adjustment. And here is the VCI out of its leatherette jacket sat on top. The controls for this machine on the front are all mechanical. This predates the days of logic control, which came just a couple of years later. Belt driven mechanical tape counter. This machine also boasts an audio dub feature, standby and pause lamps, battery indicator, another camera input, along with a mic and headphone socket. And on the right side of the machine, you have a manual tracking adjustment, which is very stiff, probably by design so you don't accidentally knock it, along with a RF output, DC in, the picture switch there is for tuner on or off, line out for audio and video out. And on the right side of the tuner, a DC port for charging the battery. Around the back of the machine we have RF in and out. A small plastic adjustment screwdriver to adjust your RF channel. Although this may vary in other countries. Test signal on and off. And then you have composite video in and out. And audio in and out. Just mono or sound, no stereo then. And there's your fuse holder and voltage adjustment switch and then the power on off. This cable here is quite a strange affair. It's exactly the same as the camera plug itself. But this actually plugs into the VCR itself. So that will get the video signal in and out uh, back to the tuner so it can output it to a television set. Looking at the serial number, it looks like this was model number 2001 in the production run for the tuner itself. And here we have the optional AC adapter and battery charger. You would only need to buy this if you haven't bought the tuner itself because the tuner will do both these things. Not everybody wanted to have a tuner. The battery type for this machine was lead acid and weighed 1.2 kilos. And here we have the Sony HVC 3000P camera. It comes in a very nice hard case. This is a tube based camera so it predates the CCD era. The Trilicon range of cameras are actually my personal favourite of cameras from this time period. One of the main reasons for that is the superior picture quality to their rivals at the time and the fact that every single one I've bought so far still works. However, you can get something called IR filter rot and there's an infrared filter in between the tube and the lens itself which blocks out the infrared rays and this can cloud over. Even some of the early Sony broadcast models can suffer the same plague. Around the back of the camera you've got some uh, function switches there along with an earphone socket. Top switch is for fader on or off. Then you've got a sharpness minus or plus button and the earpiece selector. You can either monitor the internal microphone or the VTR playback. And on the left side of the camera you have your adjustments for white balance, iris and the colour. The thing with tube based cameras is sometimes you need to adjust the hues to get the uh, colour just right. You also have a white lens cap so you can adjust the white balance. There also is a selector switch there for different types of light. You can adjust the iris manually or leave on automatic. 
and you can also adjust the sensitivity of the pickup tube depending on your lighting conditions. In the one inch black and white viewfinder you have a scope indicator you can select between white balance, waveform or iris along with a peaking switch and a brightness adjuster for the viewfinder itself. And on the right side of the camera you have a remote control socket for the optional HVR4000 wired remote. With this you can control the zoom, fader and start stop function. Recall start stop button and lock and also an optional mic input. The viewfinder cable can be unplugged so you can add in an optional extra extension cable so you can have the viewfinder right near you if the camera is further away. This model has a Synoptor lens with macro feature, manual zoom, electronic zoom and manual focus. And here is the complete setup in its entirety. An awful lot of gear here when you think about the mobile phones that we carry around in our pockets who could do all this and so much more. Well this is what the camera itself looks like. I'm actually recording onto a digital weight tape at the moment because the Betamax unit itself is actually faulty. It's got the dreaded capstan motor fault where it seizes up after not being used for quite a long time. Incidentally, I will be covering that in a future video, so stay tuned for that and keep an eye out in the description below for a link as and when I record it. Back in the day, video cameras like this would have been used to record sporting events such as kids' sports days and birthday parties and other special occasions. And I often wonder what happened to all those tapes. Did they get transferred in time to a more modern media so they could still be viewed back? These days we have the luxury of the cloud where we can just take a video recording or a picture, upload it to the cloud and view it anywhere, anytime or any place in the world. And of course within just a couple of years, other manufacturers were designing and selling their own versions of these machines. And these came in many different sizes. And of course, there were other formats available too. You had full size VHS, VHSC, this was from JVC, and these also were sold under other brands as well, such as Ferguson Video Star here in the UK. And there was also an oddball format called Technicolor, which was an unusual cassette, and these are quite rare now. Then of course there was Betamax, and then along came Video 8, another Sony format. But I shall cover these other formats in greater depth in other videos. And as time went on, Sony managed to make their machines slightly smaller. Pictured here is the Sony SLF-1 which came out around 1982. Smaller, lighter and full logic control. Well I hope you enjoyed watching that with me, it was certainly very interesting to make and it's always very interesting taking a trip down memory lane and looking back at old tech. Although I must say this episode has been quite a back breaking experience, I think in future I'll be sticking with my mobile phone. Well I think that just about closes today's episode, as always thanks for watching and until next time I'll be seeing you. And if you did enjoy watching this video you may want to take a look at some of my other videos on similar themes. I'm always buying something on eBay, some old piece of technology and trying to repair it. And as always, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. Thanks for watching.